Okay, so today we are taking a look at the Airbus A310-300. This is the free Airbus that comes with the 40th anniversary update to Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's absolutely stunning, I have to say. I've been really surprised by it. I wasn't expecting it. Um, it's taken me a good kind of half a day to learn its systems and the way to do things in it, but we're going to go through that to help you up get you up and running from cold and dark with it and we're going to go through the startup procedure how to program a flight plan and we'll actually take off and begin flying that flight plan okay so let's go and get inside the airplane one of the things you will notice about this plane straight away is the the predefined views aren't great so i've been using the various um, ways you can in flight simulator to program my own custom views so you can look this up elsewhere but you can basically press you get the view looking where you want and then you press Control alt and a number and that will program that number key then you can press alt and that number and that will move you straight to that the view that you pre-configured so i've got alt and one for the overhead panel alt and two for the eyebrow panel alt and three for the mcdu or fmc i'm not sure when this plane was developed they called this an fmc yet but we'll get there alt and four i've got for the mcp alt and five i've got for the um the center pedestal at the back just to make it easy for me to show you things but to be honest I usually press F to center the camera on the pilot's eye view and rotate the view around with the mouse because it gives you much more idea of the orientation of things around the cockpit so if you want one huge tip about using flight simulator is use this view a lot and just pan around yeah Okay, so I'm going to be referring to a checklist throughout that I've been writing up. It is a functional checklist. It doesn't include all of the checks and balances, but it cuts the startup time down to about a third. So that's important to know about. So before we get started, the first thing we're going to do is go into this tablet and we're going to click on the cog. And you will notice at the top of the cog menu there is the IRS alignment. We are going to set it to instant. In the real aircraft, when you turn on the inertial navigation system and set it to align, it can take seven or eight minutes to align. And obviously we don't want that to happen in our video because we set, sit around waiting if we make too much progress too quickly. To be honest, in the real world, when you're referring to an operational flight plan and programming the aircraft, those minutes disappear. Yeah so you will be busy doing other things but because we are compressing this it's not so much of an issue okay so first thing we do in the airbus is look overhead and we look for the battery section if i use those alt keys to explain where things are this is the overhead panel directly above our heads and there's the electrical power section in the second column and there are three battery buttons and you turn them all on so vertical lines appear through them yes so that means the power is on. If you have external power available, you can go and click on the external power button here and that will switch it on and you'll hear various fans come on around the cockpit. Okay, next thing we do is go to the APU section and turn it on. So the auxiliary power unit is a, um, a small jet engine in the tail of the aircraft that provide, uh, provides electrical power and compressed air to spin up the main engines so here's the panel for the APU so we can turn it, the master switch on for the APU and you get a low pressure warning there on the fuel pump straight away it has its own automatic fuel pump by the way and then you can hit the APU start button to monitor its progress if we press F to come back down there's the ECAM buttons down here which show the engineering display status of things if you click APU down here and then look at the second screen over here you'll see the APU coming online you can see here it's gone to 10 here these will slowly climb towards 100 yeah so we'll just give it a few moments and you'll start to see those move if we go and actually look outside just to explain this while we're waiting that is the exhaust port of the APU yeah the small jet engine is in the tail of the aeroplane Oops. so that is the exhaust port so if you go and look back inside, you will see those climbing fairly soon. So if we then, the next thing we need to do is go up overhead. There we go, they're starting to climb. I was starting to get worried then. So it takes a while for the ignition sequence to happen on that, that little jet engine. So we're going to go back up overhead. 
So I'm going to press Alt and 1 to get my predefined view. And we're going to turn on the inertial navigation system. Now there are three of them across the top of the cockpit. Looking from the pilot side view, they are right the way at the back of the overhead panel. Yeah. So we turn all three of those on and then we can turn this knob here to HDG STS which will tell us how many minutes are left until the system aligns but it doesn't do it straight away there's an as with everything around this aeroplane there's an initialization sequence so we're not going to wait for that and it will have been impacted by us setting the IRS alignment to instant as well so once we've done that we go and turn the oxygen system on so we're going to go back overhead and oxygen system is in the fourth column halfway down and we just go and turn it on and you'll see this needle spin around into the green there that's fine so now we are straight into the FMC so this is when you see the pilots getting on the plane and you see them sat in the cockpit messing around with a reef of paperwork and a sheaf of paperwork sorry and um, you know doing all sorts of programming this is what they're messing around at so you get an immediate warning here look and a line IRS is in the scratch pad at the bottom of the FMC so we'll clear that so it's saying nav acker downgraded that's fine so then I'm going to press alt and 3 which is going to just center my view up that's one of my pre-programmed views so now we can see the status page of the FMC it's just telling us dates and versions of databases that kind of thing so we go to the init page so we need to put in where we're going from and to immediately so we go and put in EGSS which is the ICAO code for Stansted Airport and we put EGPH so notice we are copying the format of the from and to up here with a slash in the middle EGPH is Edinburgh so we're going to drop that in and then we click return so let's program that in. Notice as soon as we put from and to in, a line IRS has appeared. That's what we were looking for. So then we click the soft key next to that and it disappears. And now it says we're using the GPS primary system. That's just a message. So we can clear that out. Notice when there was a message there, there was also a light here saying message. Okay, so we can give ourselves a flight ID. So I'll just call my flight, um, what should we call the flight? JB123. Oh, it's come up with that warning again, so that's fine. JB123, we just keyed it into the scratch pad and we'll drop it into the flight ID. So there is a second page to the initialization. So if we go next, we can put in the block fuel, zero fuel weight, and the takeoff. Um, oh, I've forgotten what GW stands for. Gross weight, takeoff gross weight. So if we go and look across at the tablet over here, this will give us that information. If we go and click on this, the scales icon, it gives you those numbers, but you need to click on live to find out what's in the airplane. Otherwise you're dealing with whatever's in the flight plan. Yeah, and you can apply that to the plane. So that's how you can fill the plane up really quickly. Okay, so we're looking at the the data here. This is obviously thousands of pounds. So we can write those down, which I have done already and then refer back across to put them into the FMC. So our block fuel today is 43.1. So remember we said thousands. Uh, 40, whoops, 43.1 goes into the block fuel. Zero fuel weight is 176.7. 176.7. And that's calculated the gross weight as for us automatically. Center of gravity is 28.0. That's done that for us. Okay, so we, if we go next page again, we'll come back to the front page. So we've basically done that. So now we go and program our route. So if we go into the flight plan page, if we go and click on EGSS, which is standard, we can choose our standard instrument departure. So we can say runway 22. It's just, oh, it's worth pointing out. I'm going to be flying this route, so you can see this here. We're flying the BKY-5R departure out of Stansted. We can overlay this on the map, actually, can't we, with Navigraph. So we're flying this standard instrument departure. And then once we get up to Edinburgh, we're going to fly this um, 
standard approach route um, and we're going to fly via the Trent VOR in the middle of the route okay so just to give you some visual reference of what we're programming so we're leaving on runway 22 we're doing the BKY5R standard instrument departure now there's an important mistake I made the first time I recorded this video I click return at this point you don't you have to click insert it's kind of there's this shows some evolution in the system because they've put like progress kind of buttons on the right hand side in later versions of this usually the left hand side means reverting or going back so that's something that they've changed so that inserts those legs into the flight plan so then if we go back um, we can push the flight plan through with the arrows there's another change here look it doesn't put the destination airfield always at the bottom so you do have to scroll through to get to it so EGPH we're going to set the star going into um, Edinburgh so we're going to go ILS from a 24 and we're going to go the AP, AGP E1E standard approach route and we're not going to bother with transition and we're going to return I've done it again haven't I star ILS AGP E1E insert okay so now we can push the the legs either way by using the arrow keys so when we press this it pushes the screen in the direction we push it notice we have a discontinuity in the middle of the route so that corresponds with this middle part of the route between the SID and the star so all we're going to do is insert the TNT uh, VOR in the middle so we key in TNT into the scratch pad we select where the discontinuity is and there are many TNTs in the database so it's the third one we want because that's got the correct um, latitude and longitude so we'll select that and that, notice that has pushed the discontinuity down but it's inserted it on top of it essentially so then we can clear the discontinuity and that's got rid of that so we now have a functional flight plan okay the one thing we haven't done if we go and look in takeoff approach now is put in the the data in here now the aircraft has a calculator for this so this is your rotate speeds essentially so if we go and look in the tablet and click on the aeroplane it has this calculator so Tora is um, takeoff uh, runway available I can never remember all these acronyms so we can go and check that if we pull up the information for Stansted we want runway 22 don't we so if we go and have a look if we open the airport information on it and look at runways runway 22 is uh, it's got it in meters that's not really useful to us if we open the the chart for it uh, runway 22 where's runway 22 there we go Oh, that's the approach we don't want that we want here we go 10,000 feet 10,003 feet of usable runway so we can come in here and we can put in 10,000 we can put in the the runway direction I know in advance it's 222 degrees we can put in the wind on the day so do we get the meta in here for Stansted Meta 167 knots so we need to put in 160 Ooh, that's interesting 16007 so you, you forget about the slash and just keep keying outside air temperature does this give us that as well? It is 12 centigrade, 54 Fahrenheit. So it wants it in centigrade. So we type key in 12. And it wants the barometric pressure at the moment. So it's 1028. That's in hectopascals though. We want it in inches. So it's 3035. 3035. So we've got all of the data in. Oh, we need our, the gross weight of the aircraft as well. So gross weight was 219.9. 219.9. 219 
So at that point we filled everything in and we can click calculate and it gives us our rotate speeds. So 135, 135 and a flex temperature of 59 if we choose to use it. And V2 comes out as 154. So let's go down to here. So 135 and 135. Okay, so we can go across to approach now. We can leave all that alone. Go back to go around and have a look. That's we can leave all that alone as well. Okay. So that's pretty much the flight is done, the performance data is done. So what's next on our list? I'm just gonna have a quick look around. So yeah, we're back overhead now, getting rid of the no smoking signs and things like that. So on the eyebrow panel you've got the no smoking signs over here and the seatbelt signs over here. There we go to the flight recorder section, so that's overhead. And we turn on this GNDCTL button on the flight recorder. Um, I'm just referring to my paper list now. I'm looking across the desk and it's becoming <laughs> quite difficult to look backwards and forwards. Okay, so in the lighting section we come down here, we t need to turn the strobes to auto and the nav and logo light to setting number one. We then turn on the trims. So the yaw dampers, the pitch trim and the ATS, which is I think it's automatic trim system. Okay, those will not switch on by the way. <coughs> Excuse me, those will not switch on if um, the alignment hasn't already happened of the inertial navigation system. One way of knowing if that's happened is if you've got an attitude indicator showing up then you have aligned. Yeah. So let's go and press control 2. Or another thing to, to point out down here is once you've programmed your route and you've got any rid of any discontinuities it will appear on the flight plan. Okay. Oh sorry on the um, EFIS display. So then you can play with the the zoom knob for example and the the various modes so there's plan mode if we go and look on the legs page uh, where is it flight plan page notice when you're on plan mode if you're in the legs page if you move this up and down you can step through your route yeah so you can have a good look at your route to see how it compares to how you imagined it was going to look, which is always useful. So we can come back to map mode, which is your default mode for flying, which is oriented to the aircraft. Okay, so, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here, aren't I? So we've done the yaw dampers and everything, so we're going back overhead, we're going to go and turn the fuel pumps on. So they're all in this overhead section, let's just zoom in on them a little bit. So you turn all the fuel pumps on now. We're getting ready basically to start the aeroplane up. You turn on the probe heats and turn on the window heats. Uh, we go and set the emergency lights to armed. They are on the eyebrow panel. So I, I call it the eyebrow panel. This, I've heard various pilots calling this the eyebrow panel. It's the one directly above the windows. Um, the emergency lights are over here, so we just move it. It was already on armed look, so we don't need to actually don't need to change it. APU bleed, we're going to turn it on. So this is rerouting the compressed air from the small jet engine on the APU to the main engines to spin them up. Okay. So then on the master control panel we have to go and set our decision height as well. So that's in here, you go DH and you set it to minus 5 for takeoff purposes. You also calibrate the altimeters, so press B to do that as a shortcut, but obviously you can use the calibration knobs on them. There's one over here as well, so there's a co-pilot one, pilot one and the standby altimeter. We set the landing elevation which again you might revise while you're in flight so that's going to set the height of the ground at the destination so we go and check that APU screen again on the ECAM to see it's all fine 
Uh, we go and because we are running on the APU now we can turn the external power off so APU is up and running that's why we checked it so then a external power can come off and at this point we can start the engines I'm going to do this from the pilot side view because it's easier because I need to flick around quickly so there's an ignition system the engine starter switches are just above the the windscreen in the center there's an ignition system and there's two systems A and B and it doesn't matter which you choose I guess they it, they um, switch between between them in real life to save on wear and tear they alternate them so we'll switch to system A and we will start engine number two the right engine first and it says open and if we look down on the dials down here you can see N2 or well, the gas turbine speed is coming up so that's the compressed air spinning up the engine and it's in percentage of its nominal or full speed so it's when it gets to 20 percent we can flick the starter lever for engine number two which is mildly reminiscent of the boeings and it will continue on past 20 percent the exhaust gas temperature will rise and the turbofan speed will then increase when the engine comes up to speed you will probably see the lights flicker because cross feed happens automatically in the airbus so when the engine is pr producing electricity there you go so the right side of the aircraft switched over to using electric from the engine yeah and up above that switch back from open to armed so we can then start engine number one so that switches to open and again same trick again we're watching the N2 number climb when it gets to 20% we will flick the start lever which introduces fuel so the temperature rises and the N1 number, the turbofan speed, increases. I watched an interesting video about how jet engines work the other day. I, had, I hadn't appreciated that the, the turbofan is actually free-floating, so the, the gas turbine essentially treats the... The turbofan appears at both ends of the engine, so the hot air comes out of the gas turbine and hits a windmill, essentially, which is connected directly to the front fan there you go, you saw that flicker there, that was the engine providing enough power to actually generate now. So we can turn the ignition off. So ignition goes to off. Now because the APU is no longer needed, we can turn the APU bleed back to off. And we can turn the master switch for the APU to off. Okay, so we're getting closer to flight. So we go and... We didn't turn the beacon on, did we? Completely missed that. So I'm going to put my beacon light on because the engines are running. That should have gone on during start. The reason I've kind of got a bit out of step here is normally you'd be doing pushback. And during pushback, just prior to starting the engines, you'd go and turn your beacon light on. But because we're starting from a parking spot, that's kind of thrown me slightly. Okay, so we're going to put our taxi lights on because we're going to taxi imminently. So where were we? We've armed the speed brake. We put the flap, set the flaps for takeoff. So two notches down is 15 degrees, which agrees with what the performance calculation said. And we can taxi out basically. So we can come off the parking brake now. And the plane has a very small amount of positive thrust. You can see that immediately. So I've started steering. On our way out to the runway, we can go and set the master control panel configuration. So we're going to set the speed for takeoff. It takes a little while, so we're not in a hurry. Hopefully, that guy in front of us will clear the runway before we get there. Oops. so we'll do an initial climb out to 12,000 feet just to give it a number I'm not doing this according to an operational flight plan making it up as we go along 
we know the heading is 222 degrees out. He's waiting for this plane to come in, that's why. Two degrees, so it's really just a backup. Um, vertical speed, we can set a vertical speed. This is going to be in hundreds of feet. So we could go for a thousand feet a minute. Or two thousand would, would probably be better. We'll put it for 25. There we go, there's another one coming in. He's coming in like a missile. He seems a bit fast to me. Yeah, he's doing a go around. looking good. Oh dear. No, you didn't have damage on. <laughs> oh the things you see when you're on a multiplayer system. I never turn multiplayer off because I just find great entertainment in watching what other people are trying to do. Not from a mean in not in a mean way, it's just you know it's always instructive to see how people are getting on. So we'll be a good citizen, oh, I was going to say we would, I think the guy that crashed has just respawned. Okay, so we've got a few moments to talk about the system. Um, when we take off, we just after takeoff we will go and turn on the TCAS system, the traffic collision avoidance system. Also after we rotate on the runway we are going to go and after a little way climbing out we'll trim the plane out and then turn the autopilot on and hopefully it will obey our instruction. So he's having another go look. It's not going so well again is it? Let's get our flight sorted out and stop worrying about other people. Yeah, so during takeoff, we will go. I think we can preset this actually. We can preset nav mode. Can we preset vertical speed mode? I don't think it will let us. Interestingly, you can preset level change. I'm not sure if it will obey it. We'll find out. We can't preset auto throttle until the autopilot is actually running. Okay, so flight directors are on. The flight director is signified by the green cross. So there's actually two parts to the, the system. There's the autopilot, which um, controls the aircraft but there's the flight director which is reading the, f the route and looking at where the airplane is and deciding what needs to happen so the autopilot just blindly follows what the flight director is doing okay so I've, I'm not using the toga buttons or anything like that because I want to illustrate if I've just put the throttles against the stops Look what's happening here. This will go through 100%. I better steer, hadn't I? There's a small crosswind. These planes have a giant tail, so a crosswind will rotate the aeroplane as you're trying to hold the centre line. So we're just coming towards our rotate speed. So nose up gently. And we're up. So gear up. Just trimming the aeroplane for can hold this 10 degree climb out, that's fine. Come off that crazy throttle setting. We can turn on the auto throttle now we're in the air without the autopilot. And then let's go and turn the autopilot on. So that's autopilot system number one. So nav and level change are in operation. So the plane is now following the flight plan. I've let go of the controls. We're going to pull the flaps up. 
and increase the speed to 250 knots for the climb out. Again, in the real world, you would be looking at your standard instrument departure, looking for any speed and altitude restrictions along the way. So if we reduce the range on this, you'll see the aeroplane start to turn as it gets to the first leg of the flight plan. Well, that's the plan anyway. That's what it should be doing. There we go. So the, we've gone through the leg and the flight director has said we need to turn right and the autopilot is then making that happen. So there you go. There's your basics of getting the A310-300 into the air. Hopefully that's been instructive for you. Obviously I'm not going to make you sit through the whole flight because that'll be quite boring. But yeah, hopefully that's been instructive. There's obviously a world of more information about changing flight plans en route and you know adhering to instructions and reprogramming and everything else. But that's the very basics of getting the airplane up and running. Obviously in a, a well simulated airplane things can go wrong and they will go wrong. So you end up having to oops, didn't mean to do that. You end up having to know how to work around problems. But we're not going to get into too much of that today. This was just to have a look at how it works. Notice in the earlier versions of the Airbus, the throttles moved. It wasn't just a digital throttle. So it's very much like a Boeing in that respect. Also notice the ILS um, frequency there is in the middle. It's a separate control than the VOR radios. It's worth knowing about. New cruise altitude, flight level 120. Yeah, we've done that. So it's climbing out. To, it's just gone through 10,000 feet. We should really have had the landing lights on below 10,000 feet, but we're not going to worry too much. This is just a demonstration flight. So we'll go and continue the climb on up to 18,000. I guess we could be nice to the passengers now and say you can go to the toilet. <laughs> So we just say level change on 18,000 feet. The auto throttle will maintain that. We can go faster now because we're above 10,000 feet. So just adhering to a few rules here. Let's go for 300 knots. So you can see the aircraft is climbing. You can see it's slowly accelerating now. yeah there you go there's the airbus a310 so hopefully you found that interesting and we'll do a full flight another day i need to actually do some learning about it myself i've only really learned enough to get it up and running and as i said at the start this was a functional demonstration there are a lot of checks and balances i didn't do i cut an awful lot out of the procedures okay anyway i'll see you again soon but oh, we didn't uncage the did we have to uncage that? See, this is learning. Think things about, you know, do we need to go and uncage things? But it looks like we didn't have to. Some aircraft, you have to uncage the, the backup attitude indicator. But yeah, there's, there's always going to be something new to learn. And anybody that thinks they know everything are pretty much a danger unto themselves and everybody else. So there you go. And I will freely admit that I make mistakes. I made a mistake in the first version of recording this video a pretty serious mistake. So, so there we go. I'm going to leave it there and I'll see you again soon.